Ernest, thank you so much for joining us again. Mm. Uh, I really enjoyed the last conversation we had, and I, I had a lot of questions before that I wanted to ask you. First of all, being leading up to 2024, a lot of people are speaking now about coalition governments. Um, this is outside now of Afri Forum and the work mm. you do. It's just mm. your personal opinion. What do you think is going to happen to this country within the next two years, and what do you think will happen in 2024? Mm. Well, uh, I think there's something that needs to be kept in mind, and that's the fact that uh, up until the, the election, there's, it's all just speculation. True. Anything you read in the paper, anything, it doesn't matter how big of an expert, this guy can have 60 years of experience in election prediction or whatever. Yeah. They can all be wrong. And this is what we've seen with many elections now, in the, specifically in the past five years all across the world, mm -hmm. is that the experts are often wrong. So there's no chance that X will happen and then X happens. So they sure. say this will definitely happen and then it doesn't happen. So I think it, it's important to keep an open mind and not to get too bogged down with speculation, but it is there is use in it. So mm -hmm. there's definitely, a, I will indulge a little bit in, in speculation. So... When it comes to 2024, I think the, the ANC is going to do much worse than it did in the previous election, but the, I'm also not uh, as optimistic as to think that they're going to drop below 50. I think uh, there's a big chance that they still retain their, their 50 plus You don't think support. they'll go below 50? I don't think they will. I think... Jeez, okay. But like I said, I can, I can definitely be wrong. But what I'm basing my speculation and my, my guess on mm -hmm. is the fact that the ANC has an election machine that it can only really power up every every four years. Yeah. So when it comes to a, uh, uh, every five years, when it comes to uh, municipal elections, a lot of people always look at how badly the ANC does mm -hmm. in municipal elections. They say, no, it's, it's over, it's, gonna, it's, it's the end. But then um, uh, the next election they do all right again. But they are on a steady trend down. Mm -hmm. But maybe to, to add to that, whether the ANC wins or loses in 2024 is not really a, a massive world, uh, shocker for me. It's not going to be a... If the ANC doesn't drop below 50, I'm not going to think this, the future is bleak and that there's the, like the, some people are saying, more of the same. Yeah. This is our last chance. This yeah. is our last chance. Uh, every, that's the thing, Penal. Every election is always it's our last mm. chance. This is the biggest election that there's ever going to be <laughs> in the history of humanity. This is the election of our generation. Mm. You see it in every country, not just in South Africa. You see it in the United States. Every election is the biggest election in American history. Yeah. I'm like, well, okay. Well, the, the, the stakes can't keep just going up and up and up. It's just every election can't be the biggest one. But I think what's important is that people need to diversify their, uh, they need to diversify their focus when it comes to what will influence their future. Mm -hmm. Yes, which party wins will have an influence on your future. Party politics is definitely not something that's just irrelevant. Yeah. But at the same time, there's a lot you can do and a lot you can focus on that will still have a big impact on your future regardless of what happens in party politics. Mm -hmm. That's what I've been trying to do for the past few years is to step back a little bit from party politics, watching it closely and making that my entire focus and focusing a bit more on what I'm seeing in the community around me, what I'm seeing on grassroots level. There I'm seeing a lot of stuff that's giving me hope rather than focusing just on, on party politics. So whether who wins or loses in 2024 will have an impact, but mm. it's not going to be make or break. Um, there is a lot of other stuff going on in the background, specifically the the uh, the less and less or the, the decrease in relevance of, of party politics. You don't think the local elections are a reflection of national outcomes? They can be, but at the same time, there's a lot of other... Uh, elements at play when it comes to national elections. A lot mm. of people vote in national elections that don't even uh, bother to go vote in, in, in municipal elections. And a lot of people go vote in municipal elections for other reasons than and then they don't go vote in, in, in national elections. Why do you think people don't vote? Why do you think the number's not so high for municipal? Do you think it's just a lack of marketing? Well, I think you can ask, the, the, the question can be why don't people go vote in either municipal yeah. or in, I think we get like, Six, between 60 and 70 percent of registered voters go vote and um, the thing is and that that number keeps dropping I think it in 2019 we had the lowest voter turnout yeah. uh, but I'm talking under correction no you're right yeah uh, and what that is an indication for me of is the fact that people are doing what I said earlier is that they are 
looking less and less at party politics as it's going to save them and they're going to look at alternative ways of building a future and alternative ways to take their destiny into their own hands rather than putting the the fate of their family and the fate of their community in uh, betting it all on the result of an election. Do you I don't think, f- do you think um, what did I want to ask? I wanted to ask why, why do you think young people in particular don't mm. vote? And you're saying people are relying less on politicians for solutions. Mm. The young people that are not voting, do you think they're realistically doing anything else Mm. if they're not voting? Yeah, no, that's the problem. That's the problem specifically with the youth is the fact that young people are not being taught to be future orientated. Uh, I was lucky lucky enough to be raised in a household where I was taught that you always think for yourself and you think for the future. Mm. That's your, that should be your, your, uh, approach to life but unfortunately not enough young people are taught that you have to think about the future you can't just live in the now that's that's something that you get when you go out to a a party places or to a club or anywhere you just get this message constantly live in the moment don't think about the future Mm. don't think about tomorrow think about now enjoy now yolo (laughs) but it's not healthy then uh, you wake up the next day with a with a hangover Mm. Physically and metaphorically, you end up with a financial hangover as well and you're not saving money. Not enough young people in South Africa are saving literally and figuratively for the future. We need to become more future orientated. And that means not necessarily just becoming more active in party politics. That means specifically becoming more active in or at organizations that are building the future, getting active in your community Talking to older people, that's another very important thing. That intergenerational uh, transfer of knowledge is not happening at the moment, unfortunately. Not at the level that it did in the past. Where speak to your grandfather, speak to your grandmother if they're if you're fortunate enough to still have them around. Mm-hmm. Speak to your parents if you're fortunate enough to still have them around. Ask them, what is the solution to this problem? How do you approach this? Don't think, I think the biggest mistake that we can make today is to think that the people that came before us were just stupid. And we've we've figured everything out now. There's (laughs) nothing we can learn from them. We are the future now and we're going to solve these problems that they couldn't solve. If you could get into a time machine now and go back to the past, you'll see they're struggling with a lot of the same problems that Mm. you are now and they also think they they can solve it. And there's there's this old saying of... um, you should learn from the mistakes of others because you'll never live long enough to make all those mistakes yourself. And Very true. your parents, your grandparents, your extended family, old people have made a lot more mistakes than you mm. have because they've lived longer. So talk to them. They're a wealth of knowledge and you can learn quite a lot from them and a lot more in an conv- uh, organic conversation than watching a YouTube video or asking Google the question. Ask a living being, ask another human the question. Don't just ask Google the question constantly. You're probably going to, like, for example, if you ask Google what's wrong with me, it just tells you every time you have cancer. Like, but if you ask, uh, if you ask your grandmother what's wrong, she says, oh, well, in my experience, I've seen many people have that rash or that type mm. of symptom. That means you have this. Suddenly, you, you, you're talking to a real person. You can mm. give them the context. You can give them you know, the real details of your problem. And suddenly, it's, uh, you might even find a solution. So I think that's, that needs to happen, that organic transfer of knowledge again mm. f- between generations. That's how humans operate. We are, we are not every generation's on its own. Every generation needs to be in constant conversation with the previous one. But it also doesn't mean that we should just be uh, asking the, the older generation what they think. They, they should also be in a conversation one listens as well. 100%. And they also need to listen to, because young people also have our own unique problems and own unique challenges that uh, might not, they, they might not have experienced themselves, the, the older generation. So there needs to be a dialogue. A dialogue is not a monologue. Monologue mm. is one person talks, other persons listen. Dialogue is both sides talk and both mm. sides listen. I, I love that concept. I call it uh, human libraries, that mm. every human being is like a, a wealth of knowledge. So tap in. And I love the fact that you touched on the, the dual flow of conversation because you find, especially in the African space, a lot of the elders don't want to listen to young people. And when young people have ideas, they get shut down. If they're trying to fight for those ideas, they get called disrespectful. Mm. So I really think that will be a, a game changer. If you look at the coalition politics at local government level, do you think that would be a good indication of what would happen if we have coalition at national level? 
basically I'm asking, do you think coalitions would <laughs> cause more political noise <laughs> or do you think a coalition at national level would get more done? I have a very short answer there, Penwa, and that is coalition politics and chaos are synonyms. <laughs> They're the same thing. And it, it, I'm not just using the recent politics in South Africa as an example. My yeah. sample size is human history. My sample size is the world. I'm looking at coalition politics in Italy. I'm looking mm. at coalition politics in South America, in Latin mm. America. I'm looking at coalition politics on the African continent. They are absolutely chaotic. And if you think of coalition politics are just all these different little parties are just going to come together for a united mission mm. um, and they're going to all decide we're not going to, we're going to stop fighting and we're going to work together. Yeah, you're thinking very idealistically and romantically. Um, coalition politics are nasty. That's why the recent chaos in the poli uh, party politics here in South mm. Africa as it pertains to coalitions didn't surprise me at all. I told people already last year, you're going to see a new, with all these new, coalitions forming you're going to see some chaos and dirt, dirty play and just uh, almost i always want to say just savagery from mm. from people from all sides and just, it's gonna get worse yeah because you're seeing people in the trench together shooting at each other True. metaphorically and uh, once that starts happening you can't trust anyone everyone is just going out for themselves and it's it's messy so to answer your question, yes, I think coalition politics, what we're seeing now is a very good indicator of what they could be after 2024. But I don't want to end, I don't want to end on a, on a doom note, on a, <laughs> on a, on a dark note. So rather the, 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 the silver lining there mm. is that that's exactly why you need to start diversifying where you invest your attention and time yeah. when it comes to the future. That's why you need to start looking at other uh, community-based uh, solutions for the future and not just put all your eggs in the party politics basket because they know uh, that's a very, very risky risky gamble. I'm not willing to take that gamble. That's why I'm already diversifying my metaphorical investments for the future. How do you feel about independent candidates versus political parties or hmm. party politics? Do you think independence would be a, a better model if we were to have the two extremes hmm. where people... If you're speaking decentralization and community, right. people get to vote for a leader in their community to go and represent them in parliament versus voting for a party that ends up picking people you may not even like. Exactly. No, I'm, in principle, I'm absolutely for uh, decentralizing where you can vote for a leader and a figure yeah. rather than for a, for a party. Because then if you vote for a party, as we've seen now in South Africa, you vote for the party and then they can just put anyone they want in a position. Mm. Then you end up with Becky Chele as head of police and you end up with <laughs> Fukile Mbalula as head of transport. Shut up! <laughs> yeah. That's what happens because nobody voted for them. The people, I don't want those people in those yeah, they positions. Didn't vote directly no. for them. They voted for the ANC and the ANC decide that these are the people that are going mm. to be in those positions. So no, the, the, in principle, I definitely agree with that. But also to, to broaden that principle, I think, for example, police. Police in your community should come from the community. You shouldn't yes. be, police in your street shouldn't be coming from a thousand kilometers yeah. away. They shouldn't be in Cape Town, police from KwaZulu-Natal or Gauteng patrolling the streets. They, they don't come sense. from there. There's no accountability. There's accountability when the people know this policeman that's walking around in the street goes to church with the community. Mm. He lives in the community. He Corrupt knows the him. problems of the community. Yeah. And if he's corrupt, if he abuses members of the community, there will be social consequences for him. They'll shout at his mom. <laughs> they will go tell his mom and she'll sort him out, yeah. But that's exactly how, it, at the moment, yeah. we have uh, we have policemen patrolling the, the Cape Flats that have, haven't even lived a, a year in Cape Town. They don't understand the problems of mm. Cape Town. We have policemen from Cape Town patrolling the streets in Kuala Lumpur. It's, it doesn't Crazy. work. You need, you need those people to come from the community. Firstly, that they understand the problems. And secondly, that there's accountability for them. Mm. So they, and thirdly, they have an investment in that 100%. community not having any crime. 100%. So if, if you don't live in a community, why would you really be... Uh, just there for a yeah, I'm, I'm there for a job. If there's crime or no crime, it doesn't really matter. If I get my paycheck at the end of the day, that's the... That's the mentality. So everything like that needs to be decentralized. Mm -hmm. But to get back to that previous point, leadership needs to come from the communities they mm -hmm. serve and from the regions they serve, from the towns they serve. And then the level below them, the police and the, the workers, in the, the people that are filling the potholes, the people mm -hmm. that are 
painting the street signs, the people that are planting the trees need to come from those communities as well. Because as soon as you're doing something for where the community where you are from, you're going to take it a lot more seriously. You're going to take your job a lot more seriously and you're going to be more fair. You're not going to just be an outsider that's there getting a paycheck. You're going to be a member of the community working towards the place that you live because you live there as well. If, mm. if you don't do your job, you're hurting yourself. Do you think South Africa needs a dictator? Uh, needs a dictator? Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to be the dictator? I'm here, boy. <laughs> I'm here. But I'm joking. <laughs> Do you, do you think, look, uh, obviously dictator is a bad word. Mm. When we speak coalitions and the squabbles that are happening, when we speak party politics and some of the internal friction, um, when we speak the current government mm. and how you've got a president that constantly mm. has to consult, yeah. we think or we hope for leaders that are decisive mm. in their thinking. We hope obviously they're good people, yeah. but someone who doesn't have to consult with the whole world or speak to the coalition partners... Mm. Once we decide we're going to close potholes, we close them and we move. Mm. So do you think we need leaders that are more... I think the correct word is autocratic. Mm. No, I think every community needs its own little dictator. I don't think mm. there needs to be one dictator that's dictating the entire South Africa. I think every community needs a strong leader or a collection of leaders that are representing them mm. that are... Uh, firm and are not just soft people that are saying like you said now we are going to fix the potholes in this community now we are going to make sure there's no crime in this community we are going to make sure no more old women and little girls are being raped in yeah. this community hard stances that's what we need but we need that on a decentralized level where communities are doing this not one guy sitting in pretoria saying we're going to fix the entire country and this is how we're going to do it mm -hmm. you say you have all these communities representing themselves saying we these are our problems and this is how we're going to fix them a good example is um if you look at for example uh, 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 water supply. So not every community in South Africa is struggling with water, yeah. but a lot of communities are. Those communities are going to prioritize water. Many communities, there are many forms of crime in South Africa. One of those forms is gangsterism, but not mm -hmm. every community in the country suffers with sure. gangsterism. So the communities that do suffer with an abnormal amount of gangsterism is going to put that at their top priority. So how's that system going to work if there's one dictator at the, that's dictating over the entire country? How's he going to prioritize what's important, whether it's water, electricity, gangster crime, uh, the construction mafia, uh, stock theft? There's so many different problems, mm -hmm. but the, the guy that's sitting at the top, it, there's no realistic way for him to realistically prioritize them as they are from most important to least. But the people that live in the communities affected by those problems can easily prioritize. This is our biggest problem. There's, there are people living in communities that don't, for example, have a, a big problem with, let's say, oh, there's so many problems, let's say with potholes. There's mm -hmm. some communities that don't really have potholes. So they, there's not going to be up uh, on their, their highest priority. Yeah. Uh, or uh, let's take that earlier one of a community with a problem like water supply. Well, what if the, the dictator now says the, the biggest problem in this country is water supply, so all the, I mandate all the communities and everyone in this country should start uh, paying more for water and use water sparingly. Mm. If you don't, you go to jail. What of those communities that don't have a water problem? They don't have an effect on those communities that yeah. do have a water problem, but now they're being forced to uh, follow the same type of rules. So to, to finish off... I don't think there should be one dictator. I think there should be strong leadership structures for yeah. every community in the country that knows best what their problems are and they, they should have more power to fix those problems themselves. Have you ever had a vision of an Africa that moves from over 50 states to maybe 500? <laughs> you know, you've got a situation now where some mm. people in the Western Cape want to be independent. Mm. The previous Zulu king threatened to make KZN independent like the Swati kingdom mm. when you speak decentralization do you think we should be considering removing the borders all of them on the African continent as an example and then creating new borders around like-minded communities mm. well I, don't, I can't say how that process would go I mean you, you quickly describe now one way is to erase the borders and draw new ones mm. I, in a, if we were playing a video game on a, on a computer, that would probably be how you do it. I don't know how in realistic ways how you redraw borders, but I'd yeah. like to see Africa with more countries, not less. 
um, this whole borderless thing of a borderless Africa, one United States of Africa. This is an idea that's coming from the other side of the big uh, salty <laughs> pond. It's coming from the other side of the ocean, from guy, guys with very pale complexions and long yeah. white beards. It's not, yeah. it's not organically thought of here. It is an idea that was imported here. And, uh, and you know, I know why, because they're trying it over there with the European Union, United mm -hmm. States of America. Why did the same people that criticize the United States of America want to emulate that system here in Africa? That's a, that very boggles my mind. True. If you want to, same with the European Union. Like the European Union is a European experiment that they're trying, it's failing horribly. I don't think, I don't think you should have one massive European Union uh, centralized project deciding what the Germans should do, what the French should do. This is uh, what uh, the, the, the Greeks should do. And it's being decided by people, not even, again, from the communities that they're dictating. True. That's going to happen in a borderless Africa. In a borderless Africa, there's going to be a, board, a, go, a borderless government sitting thousands of kilometers away deciding what's, go, what's happening in your community. Mm. People deciding not e people not even from your community deciding what your what's best for your community. Mm. That's not right. That's that's uh, that's not the future. But that is a utopian idea that's that's being imported from abroad, and that's something that I think a lot of the, the average person on the street does not want. That the, to get back to that previous point, the average person wants people from his community mm. deciding what's best for them, not. Uh, a government a thousand kilometers away and definitely not a government 10,000 kilometers away. Do you think we should decentralize tax? First question. Second question is, um, do you think we should rethink our borders in the mm. sense of the way they currently operate? So mm. currently we have borders mm. like mm. America and Europe. Right. It is not organic and you, mm. you need to have a passport. You maybe need to get a visa. Um, maybe we could come up with something more relevant. I mean, if mm. you're um, educated, you have a specialized skill like your medical doctor, maybe it should be easier for you to move. Maybe we should have one ID on the continent, but it captures all your information so mm. that you can move. But we obviously make sure... If you look at South Africa as an example, we've got a state. Mm. You've got a waterfall state, you've got a stained city. Those mm. are forms of borders. Mm. So maybe should we consider things like Urania as an mm. example? Should mm. we relook how the borders are set up and how they work? Mm. And do you think we should decentralize tax? Mm. Okay. Uh, the previous question I answered a bit more realistically, but let's, uh, let's approach this question more idealistic in regards to doesn't matter how we're going to achieve it, yeah. or realistically or not. Let's, let's say we can just redraw now. We are, we are the, the dictator of Africa. Yeah. Um, I would definitely say that borders need to be redrawn based on solid identities, not national identities. So okay. you can't draw borders with a ruler. It just, it doesn't work. <laughs> you're, you're, you're cutting off people from their own family yes. sometimes th through a border. Yes. So borders need to be organically formed and they need to be based on real identities like mm. culture, language, religion. These things, when you, when you take those elements, there's a lot more. Those are just some of the main examples. Sure. Culture, language, religion. If you take those, and you put them in an artificial environment, there's gonna be conflict because mm. they are there's a lot of things that they disagree on. But mm. if you give them organic borders and you give them organic, uh, you have them organically determine where their homelands are, where they live, where they feel at home, mm. then there's a there's a lot more uh, there's a lot more there that's organic and real and human rather I than wanna a, interrupt you. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, while you're speaking, I'm just thinking. Mm. While you're answering, I apologize. No, um, no, go for it, yeah. Do you think we need to have a conversation about apartheid? Hmm. And that there may have been certain merit in some of the ideology. Not the way it was rolled out, but if we're speaking about creating communities of like-minded people that share culture, identity, was that maybe not some of the thinking hmm. that the guys had? No, the problem with apartheid is the fact that you still have a central government deciding where people live. So what I was okay. talking about is organically people congregating where they feel at home. The and for so example, the issue with apartheid was a centralized government making decisions government deciding on these things for communities. People. Yeah, cool. deciding it for them artificially. Cool. And, to, and if they don't like it, the, the government told them, well, then you don't have a choice. Happy. That's immoral. That's not right. Happy. What I'm talking about is or that organically happening, people congregate where they want to, build their communities where they want to, not some centralized government far away saying the Zulus live here, the Khorsas live here, sure. the 
deities live here, and if you don't like it, then tough luck. That's Happiness. not that's not moral, and Happiness. that's that's the the big issue. That's why I don't support apartheid. That's why Afri Forum also doesn't support it because it's a central. It's again a centralized model, not a decentralized model. Yeah. Decentralized model is organic. It's human. A centralized model is mechanical, state based. It's like almost like a computer deciding this is the this is where these people live. This is where they live. If they put one step across that border, then it, they get thrown in jail. That type of a uh, that type of thinking. So relooking borders and building a Western Cape KwaZulu mm. that is like an Orania waterfall city. Would would you consider something like that as an idealistic solution to Perf the current strict borders we have? But in a perfect scenario, people live voluntarily where they want. Mm. So let's take for example Orania and KwaZulu Natal. Mm. The people living there, nobody's told the Iranians, the Afrikaners live in this small little piece of the desert. This is your homeland or whatever. They went and lived there because that's where their dream is. That's, their, that's where they want to build their future. The Zulus as well. The Zulus don't live in KwaZulu just because some government told them the Zulus are only allowed to live here. They live there because that's their homeland. That is where they feel at home. That's where their ancestors lived. And uh, the type of government that uh, tries to meddle with that will take, it, it, it's like, the, it, like I said earlier, it's almost mechanical. It's like a machine. The machine would try to optimize and say, well, if we move this culture to this place, it will be better. And we move this. It's not human. It's not, it's not built organically. Organically means people congregate where they feel at home. People congregate where they feel they are being represented. They congregate where they feel this is where my ancestors lived, this is where I want my future, and this is, um, this is where I want to be. That is organic organization, mm -hmm. as opposed to state-mandated organization like you get with the Homelands Act or where you get with uh, state-enforced uh, expropriation and movement, where you say, I don't care if you're, uh, where the state tells you, it, do it doesn't care that your ancestors are buried on this ground. This has now been earmarked for this new project you have yeah. to move. Or where the state tells you it doesn't care that you have been living in this area. Your family and your tribe and your clan have been living here for five, ten, six generations. Mm -hmm. That's not part of, of the state's vision. So now you're going to be moved. And... All of this is under the the assumption of like you're going to like you're you're going to do this because it's for your own good because the machine or the central <laughs> state knows best, and that's where we still live. We we went from one centralized system, the apartheid system, to a new centralized system, the mm. ANC system, where the government keeps telling you. You can't make your own decisions as a community. You can't do your own thing as a community. We're going to tell you how you do it, and you're going to like it, and you're going to uh, be better or for it because the government knows best. My last two questions. The first one is to bring back um, your feelings around decentralized tax. Mm -hmm. And then the second one, do you have an opinion on the impact of cryptocurrencies and blockchain on the political mm -hmm. landscape and even tax collection? Mm -hmm. Well, by decentralized tax, I understand it as that there's still taxation, but that money is kept within the where it is taxed from. Yeah. I'm completely in favor of that. The money, the people that are paying the money, they should see that money being, that tax money being pumped into something in their community. It's their yeah. money afterwards. I mean, um, you can't tax one community and use that tax to pay the salary of a politician in another province. That, Which happens that, that, currently. Yeah, that's currently what's happening. Mm. People are... Communities are paying already in tough economic times. They're paying their hard-earned money to the government. The government's using that money to pay the salary of a politician somewhere on the other side of the country. Mm. That shouldn't be shouldn't be happening. That money should be going into the schools of that community. It should be going into the roads of that community where it's being taken from by the sure. government. Um, when it comes to crypto and decentralization, that's a that's a topic that I don't have a, I'm not going to pretend I'm a big uh, knowledgeable guy on. Yeah. Looks like there's a lot of potential there. It is very uh, interesting topic that I often listen uh, and read about, but it's definitely not uh, my field of expertise. I would think there's a lot, there seems to be a lot of potential for decentralized finance there. Sure. Um, and I would, I definitely support anyone looking into it. Um, but that's definitely one of those cases where I say, don't believe what I say, go research <laughs> what I say. 
um, go go see for yourself. Go do your own research. Um, uh, I, I'm, there's a lot a lot of people a lot smarter than me that'll be able to give you the complete uh, crash course on uh, the benefits of of that field. In closing, um, what would you like to see being the outcome of the national political elections mm -hmm. in 2024? Yeah. I would ideally want to see the, the ANC voted out of existence. They don't get a zero Completely. percent. Yeah, destroyed. Okay. I'd like to see them just disappear. I sure. think they, that would benefit everyone in this country. But that's not realistic. So I'd rather just like to see parties that have a proven track record of delivering for their voters to be given a chance and to be given more support and the parties with a track record of not delivering and only delivering divisiveness and lies to uh, to not get uh, to get more support who those parties are uh, to talk to your audience more directly you vote for the people that represent you i'm not a support of you vote for the biggest opposition or you vote for the the party that has the most realistic chance of winning yeah. A lot of people get angry for my, for, uh, for, at me for that view, but I believe you vote for the party that re best represents you, even if it is a small party. I think you need to rep you need to put your vote where your values and your ideas are. You need to vote for the party that represents you the most clearly. Don't let the bigger opposition parties, whether they be the whoever, the EFF, DA, Action SA, anyone, don't let any of them bully you and say you have to vote for a big party, <laughs> otherwise it's a, it's a waste. Um, like I said, that's probably one of my more controversial opinions. I think you vote for the party that represents you, and if a lot more people do that, maybe some of those small parties will be a lot bigger than they are today. Aris, thank you so much for joining us, and I look forward to engaging with you again. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Penwell, and I look forward to chatting to you as well. Easy. Oh, 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 oh,